The scripture reading this morning is from Colossians verse 1, 3 through 8. Colossians 1, 3 through 8. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and have the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Ephorus, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. When you look for a Bible, I don't know what qualities you look for, but I generally look for a good leather cover. I bought this Bible going close to 15 years ago, and the cover is made of pigskin, and that's what most genuine leather Bibles, if you just go to Walmart or a bookstore and get one, it's made of pigskin. Now, the problem with pigskin is over time, when you handle it, it gets a little tacky, like a football. And so, Thelma and Scott, I will not be putting my, pulpit or my Bible on the pulpit today because I got a piece of glitter on this about five years ago, and I think I got it out last week. <laughs> and I'm not going to get more glitter on it, so just have to hold my Bible today. By the way, if you don't want a Bible that gets tacky with time, get one that's cowhide or kangaroo. Do you know you can get a kangaroo hide Bible? Yeah. It's thick, it's hard, and it's very inflexible, so you may not like it. I wouldn't, but. Anyway, enough on the Bible lessons and what's good. We're so glad that you're here this morning, that you've chosen to be with us, especially those who are members here. We know that it is good to be together once again with the family, but those who are visiting with us, we want you to know that you're welcome and wanted here at the Brighton Church of Christ. As we seek to go to heaven, to take as many as we possibly can each and every week, we want to do Bible things the Bible way for Bible reasons to bring glory and honor to a God who has created us, who sustains us and provides for us each and every day of our lives. For that, we come together and we worship Him in an assembly. Obviously, we can worship Him wherever we want and whenever we want, but this is the time that God has called us together, to gather around His table, to be His people, to be His family. It's important as we look at that, that if you are visiting with us, we want you to know that that if you're looking for a, a church family to identify with or a group of people to go to heaven with, look no further than the Brighton Church of Christ. You will find kind and happy and generous hearts here as we all hold hands and seek that heavenly realm. We think about heaven, we think about God, we think about Christ, we think about the exalted Christ. Colossians chapter 3 says that he is seated at the right hand of God. This week we're going to begin a study of of different lessons and different ideas from the book of Colossians. But as we say, uh, Colossians is about the exalted Christ, or some will say the preeminent Christ, coming from chapter 1 and verse 18. It was this week that I saw an advertisement from an evangelical group calling this month the the month in which Christians pray for Muslims. Now, I have to admit, at first, my reaction was, well, they're they're compromising. Why why are these so-called Christians praying for Muslims? But the more I thought about it, the more I realized how much we need to be praying for those who are in the Muslim faith. I realize that we need to be praying that their eyes might be open to the truth of God and to the truth of Jesus Christ in His exalted glory. I realize how much we need to pray uh, for their conversions, that they would leave this fantastical religion and come to Christ, this this true Christ uh, who who guides us. That we pray for their, their failure when they are intent on violence and hate and death. We pray that they might fail in those efforts. We, we pray that, uh, uh, that the religion itself might collapse under the weight and burden of truth. So those are prayers that we ought to be praying for our Muslims. We, 
we might pray individually for those, if they're not going to convert, that they might at least seek peace with mankind. Peace with those with whom they disagree. Certainly there's a lot of things that we can pray for the Muslim community about. To pray for our neighbors that are Muslims, or our co-workers that might be Muslims, friends or relatives. But here's my question. What should we be praying for Christians and the church? While a prisoner at Rome, Paul uh, received many guests, Acts chapter 20 and verse, or 28 and verse 30, many of whom were what he would refer to as fellow laborers or fellow servants or literally fellow slaves to Christ in the ministry. And during this time, he wrote what we generally refer to as the prison epistles, which are four of of the letters of the Pauline corpus. And they are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These prison epistles were written probably within a two-year span, maybe even a a much smaller span than even two years. But it is figured that he is in Rome uh, under house arrest from the year 60 to 62 A.D., And so to sometime during that time of 60 to 62 that these letters are written. By the way, these seem to be written prior to 62 because in that year, the city of Colossae suffered a massive earthquake. And there seems to be no reference to the earthquake in Paul's writings. And so most believe that Colossians was written prior to 62. We know that he's in prison in 60, and so there's a very small window here that these so-called prison epistles uh, were, were most likely written. The letters themselves reveal a common themes. When you read Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians especially, you see very common themes between them. Uh, they follow a very formalized letter-writing style, uh, and so there's a common style. They even have common people. Uh, For example, Colossians is written to the church at Colossae, which is a a small town, which at one time had been a a big, glorious town because there were two major Roman highways that intersected in Colossae. Sometime just prior to the first century, one of the major highways was moved to Laodicea, which was about 14 miles away. From that moving, uh, the, the town of Colossae immediately began to dwindle in size and in importance in the Roman Empire. Uh, but Philemon, as we know, the book of Philemon was written to a man by the name of Philemon who actually lived in Colossae and was a member of the church in Colossae. In fact, uh, uh, one of the, the overlapping ideas is that um, their concluding salutations repeat many of the same names. For example, uh, in Philemon 23 and 24, he mentions Demas and Aristarchus and Luke and Mark and Epaphras. Uh, In the salutation of Colossians in chapter 4 and verses 10 through 14, he mentions Demas, Aristarchus, Mark, Luke, and Epaphras, some of the same men. Uh, Of course, one that is very notable in both letters is the presence of Onesimus, who was Philemon's slave, and who, had, who was with Paul at the writing of the letters, and by whom Philemon and Colossians are carried to their ultimate end. There is another man that is mentioned, Tychicus, who happens to be a, 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 a servant of Paul, and he carries the letter of Ephesians and Colossians to their destination. It appears what is happening is that Paul has written at least these three letters Uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon at about the same time, hence a lot of the the same themes. As he rolls the letter up and he sends them, he gives it to Tychicus and Onesimus, who must travel through Ephesus to eventually get to Colossae. And as they're passing out the letters, there's a special one just for uh, Philemon, and that is delivered to him as well. And so uh, it seems that these three were probably written within weeks, if not days, of one another and delivered as quickly as possible. Colossians, as a book, is written to this church that is threatened by an amalgamation of teaching, uh, of of human philosophies, Judaism, mysticism, and Christianity. It seems that they never met a doctrine that they didn't like. Whatever came up, they embraced it, and they had to somehow get it to fit in with everything else that they are facing or that they had already learned. 
We, we, we look at American culture, and American culture is doing very much the same thing. We'll take a little science, we'll take a little mysticism, we'll take a little Christianity, a little world religion, and we'll mix it all together and we'll make it fit. We'll cram it all together. And so that seems to be what Colossae had, had done as a, as a citizenship and even as, as a church. And so this letter was sent to the church at Colossae to arrest the development and, and, and restore Christ to his preeminence. Colossians is marked as, as, as one of Paul's greatest letters about Christ. It has a robust refined, richer uh, uh, Christology than any of Paul's writings. The, the great Christ hymn, which we'll look at next week, uh, uh, is, is a, a wonderful example of how he, he sees Christ and who he is and what he's done. And what we see in, in, in all of, the, uh, of Paul's letters is, is this, uh, this development of his own understanding and how he grows himself as, as a, I think, as a missionary, as a Christian, as an author, uh, as an apostle, he, he, we see growth, personal growth, even in his letters. And, and we come to Colossians, and it's not just about the exalted Christ. It ultimately comes down to this one fact. Jesus is all we need. That's it. We don't need the human philosophy. We don't need the, the, scab, uh, the, the, the uh, scaffolding of Judaism anymore. We don't need these other things that they were mixing with their Christian faith. Jesus is all we need. So he begins this letter with, uh, as Paul's style was, with, with a prayer of thanksgiving and intercession for the church at Colossae. What's interesting in Colossians, though, is that his prayer that he mentions here is more fully developed than other letters. Other letters, he might say, we have not ceased to make mention of you in our prayers. But in Colossians, he actually gives us the things that he's praying for them about, the intercessions that he's giving and I think the reason is, is he's praying that they might uh, uh, be prepared to receive the instruction that Paul is about to give. So this morning what I'd like to do is, is start with this Spirit-inspired prayer that Paul, Paul gives and see how it applies to us. And if, if in, in the day in which Colossians, the letter was written or, or, or read to the church at Colossae, they were encouraged by this prayer to know that what Paul was praying for them, uh, and it, it helped prepare their hearts and their minds to receive the, the writing itself, then maybe as we read this prayer also, we put ourselves in that position that our hearts and our hearts, our hearts and minds might be also prepared the way they were at Colossae. Begins with this this promise or this declaration of thanksgiving. Notice beginning in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We're so thankful for who you are. Now what's interesting is it doesn't appear that Paul has ever been to Colossae. He does not know any of the Christians at Colossae except Philemon who had served him and met him at another place. But uh, it doesn't appear that he knows the church there very well. And yet, here's a man who is so thankful for people that he doesn't even know. That's one of the great things about the church is we don't have to know everybody in a, a certain congregation across the state or on the other side of the country or around the world. But yet, we can still rejoice and be glad that, that Christians are not only surviving, but they're thriving in other parts of the world to know that their hearts and their minds are attached to God and that they are growing because of it. That's one of the beautiful things when you're in an in a unfamiliar place, maybe a foreign land or a different part of the state or maybe up in New England or something, and, and you attend church services up there, and you may not know anybody in the building, but you know every one of them. You know them all because you know their hearts and their minds have also been arrested by the greatness of God's grace, the blessedness of Christ's presence, and pulled them in. They're Christians. And they have a heart like you have a heart. What's interesting to me, though, is that Paul, uh, one of the things, or what he, he says here, he's thank, thankful for the report that he's received from Epaphras. But he's thankful, first of all, that they have exhibited the eternal triad of, of Christian principles, the cardinal Christian virtues. 
We see it in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It's a verse that's well known to us about the exaltation of the greatness of the virtue of love itself and, and how it ought to be found in the hearts and the mind of every single Christian. But notice what he says. For since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints and because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven, why is he thankful for their faith, their hope, and their love? The very things that he says are the eternal triad. These three will abide or remain forever. Faith, hope, and love. Their faith, of course, was in Christ Jesus, the beginning of faith. And, and, and that, that faith will lead to eternal life, the hope which we have as Christians. And it comes through a, a life that is filled with loving toward God toward others and even ourselves. And that's what they have. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, you have that kernel which begins to draw you closer to God. An acceptance, a reliance, and a trust in Jesus Christ to accomplish what He's promised to accomplish in our lives. But not only that, He says, love, you have a love, but notice specifically He says, for all the saints... For all of those who are holy. In fact, the word saint means sanctified or comes from the idea of sanctified. Those who have been sanctified in the blood of the Lamb. He's talking about Christians, the household of God. I'm so thankful to hear about your love for the brethren. I'm also thankful that the hope that you cling to is, is, is not a hope just in a brighter future here on this earth, but ultimately it is a hope that is laid up for you in heaven. It is the realm beyond. It is the life after death, the abundant life, which might begin here, but ultimately is fulfilled there. Secondly, we see that Paul is also excited or thankful for them uh, because they have exhibited fruit. Notice verse 6, he, he, he says... Uh, um, talking about the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day that you heard of it and understood it, uh, or understood the grace of God and truth. And so uh, he's looking at the gospel and he says, the gospel has, has come to you, it has been preached to you indeed as it has in all the world. In other words, uh, uh, you know, the question some people ask is, does this mean that the gospel was preached everywhere on the whole globe? It might be. But it seems more probable that what Paul is talking about is uh, uh, that what you received is what has been preached everywhere else. It doesn't change by region. It doesn't change by country. It doesn't change by language. It is the same gospel that has been preached everywhere, and it has come to you. And what is it doing? It is, notice, bearing fruit. And we think about bearing fruit, there's a lot of different things that we, we might consider. We're talking about, you know, maybe the fruit of the Spirit, or we're talking about doing good works and good deeds. But really, in this context, this part is not talking about those. I think the fruit that he's specifically talking about here is the kind of fruit that the gospel, when it is preached, produces, which is Christians, converts. He's talking about conversions. It came to you and it made converts. You continue to preach it, and what's it doing? It's still making converts. People are coming to know Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And so it has changed the world by bearing fruits and converts out there. It is changing Colossae by bearing fruits and conversions in your presence as well. The church was growing. The preaching of the gospel is able to produce these good fruits of conversions. Then he moves from the idea of thanksgiving to one of intercession. The idea that he's going to step in between them and God and intercede for them. Sort of like a mediator. And he's going to pray specifically for some, I think, some very profound ideas about prayer. You know, oftentimes when we start praying for one another, we focus on what? Health, right? Comfort. Someone's passed away, we pray for the comfort of the family. Those, those are perfectly fine prayers, nothing wrong with those. Sometimes we might pray for, 
prosperity. I don't think there was anything wrong with praying for prosperity. That you know, we do well in our, our works or our jobs. Nothing wrong. That doesn't make us greedy to want to pray for prosperity and the ability to take care of our family. Nothing wrong there. Notice Paul doesn't mention any of those. There's another time in, in, in another letter in, in Ephesians, he talks about Epaphroditus and praying for him because his health was bad, but he doesn't mention that here. What does he pray for? The first thing that he mentions, beginning in verse 9. And so, from the day we heard... Now, it's interesting, he keeps using this phrase. For example, we see it at the, end of verse, uh, uh, for, uh, at the beginning of verse 4. Since we heard of your faith, and then he talks about how uh, when they when they have heard uh, of the grace of God uh, since the day you heard it and understood it, in verse six, and now he uses it again here uh, from the day that we hear we heard. It's actually uh, uh, the the word is hearing, and the implication is upon hearing this, this is what happened. So uh, uh, hearing of your faith, hearing of the gospel. Now, again, the, the hearing uh, the, of, of you, we have not ceased to pray. We have continued to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so the first part of His prayer is that they might be filled with knowledge. When I think of knowledge, one of the first things I jump back to is the old... Um, Schoolhouse Rock song, you know, America's favorite schoolhouse. And I, I remember the, the line in there when they would say, knowledge is power. I love that one. Maybe you don't remember that, that particular song, but it was the opening. Knowledge is power. And the whole, whole idea of Schoolhouse Rock was to impart knowledge to, pe- or to kids on Saturday mornings while they're watching the cartoons. And knowledge is power. But you know, it's interesting, uh, uh, Schoolhouse Rock didn't coin that phrase. That phrase is attributed to Francis Bacon uh, back in the, in the 1600s. And, and so it was very old by the time Schoolhouse Rock latched onto it. Thomas Jefferson was famous for writing knowledge is power uh, throughout his letters to different individuals. Because when we know certain things, that gives us, it gives us the power to change them, to, to uh, uh, embellish them, to, to make them grow. Uh, uh, whatever we need to do, that, 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 those things come through knowledge. And what we find is that it's, it's a, it goes back even further than Francis Bacon. It goes back to biblical times because God has always made note that knowledge is power. A lack of knowledge brought the downfall of his nation. In Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They were weak because they didn't have knowledge. They didn't have its great power. Knowledge in this context is said to bring wisdom, which by definition is a capacity to understand and function or apply what we understand and understanding, which is the acumen to actually comprehend. You know, it, it, it's true that different people comprehend different ways, right? Some people do well at abstract thought, and other people don't do so well at abstract thought. Some people excel at math. Other people hate math, or maybe they don't excel at math. Our minds are created differently. And so what Paul is praying is that that whatever capacity our mind has, whatever ability we have to to understand and comprehend, he says, I pray that it will be filled with his will. With the will of God. That's what it needs to be filled with. But what's interesting here is the knowledge is given or associated with the Spirit. Uh, The ESV translates it as spiritual wisdom. But the idea is that this wisdom and the understanding of God's will, it it, it comes from the Spirit to help the Christian navigate the perils of secular and mystic and and religious worldviews. They're confronted by a barrage of so many different ideas and doctrines and philosophies. And, And Paul says, I'm praying that your mind will be filled with this with this knowledge that brings godly wisdom and godly understanding and the will of God. 
But he doesn't stop there. He goes right in and he says uh, to, that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and be fully pleasing unto him. I, I, it, it's not enough to be spiritually wise according to, to Paul, but, uh, but, but our relationship with God through the Spirit must translate into a transformed life. We've got to be changed by it. The atheist can read the Word of God and store it up in his mind, recall it in debates that he might have with Christians, and sometimes even better than the Christian himself. And yet because that Word, that knowledge of the Word of God has not transformed his life, he is still a lost individual. Paul says, I'm praying that you be filled with the knowledge for the purpose of that your life may be changed, that you may walk, Throughout the New Testament, especially Paul's letters, the idea of walking is used to mean a manner of life. How you live your life from day to day. We are raised to walk in a newness of life. For example, in Romans 6 and verse 4, uh, we walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16. We we walk worthy of our calling, Ephesians 4.1. We walk not as the Gentiles walk, Ephesians 4 and verse 17. Uh, over and over, Paul uses this idea of walking to mean a manner of life. And he says, I want your walking, your manner of life to be, notice, worthy. That's kind of a scary word, isn't it? Worthy. What makes you worthy? Have you ever thought about that? Why me, God? Have you ever asked that question? I'm not good enough. I, I, I've messed up too much. My life, I, I can't even straighten out my life right now, God. Why me? How could I possibly be worthy? And, and what's interesting is Paul, Paul puts the burden of worthiness here directly on me. I pray that you will walk worthy. And we realize we're worthy of heaven because of the righteousness of Christ. We're worthy of our eternal inheritance because of His blood. Not because my life is just that good. Not because I'm, I've earned it or have bought it. It's because of Christ. Paul's not really looking at that aspect, though. He's saying, I'm praying that you will now, since you have been made worthy by the blood of the Lamb, that, that you will now live your life in such a way that it fulfills the purpose, that you live suitably as one who wears the name of Christ. All the way back in the Ten Commandments, you remember he says, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. The word take really is the idea of to carry, to carry a burden, right? You will not carry the name of God in your life in vain. Well, how will you do that? If you call yourself a child of God and you don't strive to live as God would want you to live, that's bearing the name of God in vain. It doesn't really have anything to do so much with your speech as with your life. If your life does not reflect God, then you're carrying His name in vain. This is exactly what Paul is talking about here. If your life does not reflect Christ, if it is not suitable to be called Christ, if it somehow detracts from Christ uh, uh, and, or diminishes His glory to those around us by the words we tell or the jokes that we tell or the words we speak or the deeds that we do on, a, on the week Monday through Friday, if it somehow diminishes the glory of God, we are not work, walking worthy of Christ. Our daily lives must reflect his glory to all of those around us. And Paul says, I, I pray that your understanding, your knowledge of the will of God will lead you to walk in this manner that is worthy of the Lord. 
When we fulfill our purpose, he says, it is fully pleasing to him. We talk about wanting to make God happy. We want to please the creator. Well, how do we do that? We walk worthy of of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. But how does that come? Let's read a little further. Uh, He says that, that we are fully pleasing to him when we what? Number one, bear fruit. When we are bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now what's interesting is we go back to verse 6 and he says that the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. So he uses the same two words in verse 6 where he's talking about the gospel bringing converts along. But here he's talking about bearing fruits and increasing in the individual. This is, I believe, talking about that fruit of the Spirit. The production that the Spirit does in our lives, it is not enough uh, uh, to simply uh, uh, be spiritually wise in these things, but it actually has to be doing something. Where before the gospel was producing more uh, more converts, here it points to the, the fruit in the life of the Christian. Which ultimately, in John chapter 15 and verse 8, we tell uh, that, that, that God is glorified when His disciples bear much fruit. And not only is it bearing fruit, but it's increasing. Notice, in the knowledge of God, we, we, when, in order to be pleasing to God, we must be bearing fruit, number one. Number two, we must be increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, that, that sounds like what he, he was just talking about. In, in, at the beginning of this, this intercession prayer, being filled with the will of God. Maybe. I think the object here is different on purpose. It's not just about accumulating the will of God, but it's about coming to actually know God. And the Bible tells us we can know God. Hereby we know that we know Him. Well, how? We keep His commandments. We can come to know God more fully. I hope we recognize that in our lives, that we are seeking to know Him on a deeper level. But not only that, He says, not only are you bearing fruit, you're increasing in knowledge, you are being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. I love this because he, he, he says uh, uh, being strengthened with all power, the ESV. Uh, the word strengthened and the word power come from the same word, that you may be strengthened with the greatest strength or with all strength, which God is talking about and willing to share with us by His glorious might. Not a power of ourselves, but a power that comes from God. And it reiterates this fact that what God demands, God provides. We sing a song sometimes, uh, the song, Follow Me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then what? Just a cup of water is all I demand. What's that a promise? That's a promise that when God says, this is what I want, I'm going to supply your every need. If I ask you, to walk in a manner worthy of me, I will give you the power and ability to accomplish it. I will give you the strength that it takes to do those things. Through the work of His Spirit, Christians are able to walk worthily of, uh, and, and with endurance, that is, bearing up under the pressure in this context, with patience, that is, to endure pain and joy. One of the, one of the many philosophies that abounded in Colossae was the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoicism, the Stoics as they were known, uh, met life with calm assurance. Self-assurance, we might say. Meaning, uh, some of you may remember an old show, uh, Star Trek, (laughs) and Spock, the Vulcan. The Vulcan way of life was to show no emotion. That was very much, uh, uh, Roddenberry used the Stoic philosophy as the foundation of Vulcan philosophy. The real Stoics. 
They were ones who would bear up under pressure. They were ones who would endure pain and would do so calmly. And that almost sounds like what Paul is saying here. But he adds something the Stoics never added, never even considered. That you endure with patience and joy. Joy. It's like in Acts 4 when they left the flogging. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for that name. We face trials and tribulations. And yes, we, we must endure. And yes, we must be patient. But, but the thing that, 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 that transcends, that takes Christians out of the realm of worldly human philosophy is that we have patience and endurance with joy, with happiness, that we are counted worthy to suffer for the name, that our calm acceptance of what is happening to us is not because of our self-sufficiency, but it is because of Christ's sufficiency. And now we're getting to the heart of the matter, that Christ is the center of our success. And this is going to play out through the rest of the book of Colossians. And it needs to be played out in every one of our lives. That we are who we are. We can do what we do. We accomplish what we accomplish because of Christ. And we turn around then and we give thanks to the Father for what He has done for us. Paul's prayer, even praying, he says, I'm praying also that you will give thanks to God. Thanks to the Father. Why? Because He's qualified us. That is, to share in the inheritance that is lauded to those who are saved, to the saints. There's an inheritance of the saints that God has already set aside, and now God has qualified us, His children, the Christians, to receive that allotment. He has delivered us. For the domain of darkness, in verse 13. And sin, which is controlled by the devil and his angels. Evil dominates this dark domain. and <coughs> It even faced Jesus in the garden. Yeah, I know, I had to put my Bible down because i got a good drink now. Scott, I blame you. Scott watches these lessons. So I said, inflict more pain. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 53, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, <coughs> he mentions that the domain of darkness, the domain of darkness, that's what this is. The domain of darkness is, is flexing its muscles, as it were. Paul uses this same idea, this domain of darkness, to refer to the world, the world without Christ. But he has, he, has, he has delivered us from this domain of darkness. Number three, He, he has transferred us into the kingdom of his, his dear Son, His beloved Son, the Son of God. We are citizens of Christ's domain of light. He has redeemed us from slavery to sin. The evil taskmaster, Jesus calls it in John 8 and verse 34, He bought us with the price of of his blood. And even though it doesn't mention it here in the Colossians verse, in the parallel in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, he has re redeemed us by the blood. And finally, he has forgiven us all of our sins. There is no sin which God's grace cannot forgive if we seek him in faith. This was, this was Paul's prayer. God's work in us and for us demands an attitude, a heart of gratefulness and appreciation. But, but notice in this context, the work is done. It's complete. It's finished in us. In anticipation of the glorious realm of the hereafter, it's completed in us. What is your prayer? What is your prayer for the church as a whole? What is your prayer for the church at Brighton? for the people that make up this congregation, uh, for your own family, 
does it consist of intercessions for knowledge and life and strength and attitude, or is it merely for comfort and health and prosperity? I think we know where, where God wants us to be. Think about this. Basically, what, what Paul was praying for is better Christians, right? I mean, we think about it. We, we all say, well, I know I could do better. I know I could do better. We all know that it's possible to be a better Christian. So what does Paul do? Paul takes, by inspiration, he takes time to say, I'm praying that you might be a better Christian. Now, are you a better Christian? Oh, I don't mean, are you better than me? Or better than so-and-so? But are you better than you have been? I think if we could chart some Christians' lives on a, on, a, on, a, on a graph, you know, when they first obeyed the gospel, here's their level of spirituality, and, you know, with time, you know, maybe it's here now, and then, you know, then, then maybe over here it's, you know, a little more time, and, and we started charting. What if we were charting your success? Would, would, your, would your graph, here if I can draw it backwards, would your graph tend to go up? Would it, would it go up for a little while and then kind of plateau and stay there? Or worse, would it maybe go up and then just start to fade? Are you a better Christian? Maybe this morning you're looking at your life and you're saying, Sam, I'm, I'm not a better Christian. Maybe you're coming to grips with that right now and saying, I need to do better. I know what I can do to be better. Paul prayed for you right here in this prayer. He's giving us signposts along the way, how we can be better. And maybe you need the prayers of this congregation to help you to reach those milestones. You're saying, Sam, I'm, I am better than I used to be. But I know I can still grow. I, I hope that you will seek growth even in your life in that way. I don't know what your needs are. Maybe you need to become a child of God because you've never obeyed the gospel. You know, all things are ready for you now to become part of that family, to put away the old human philosophies, the doubts, the hesitation, the pride, the shame and guilt, set those aside for a moment and come to a loving God who gave His Son for you. We're about to stand and sing an invitation song. We call it that because in this song, we, we want to give you time right now to make your life right. Become that child of God. All things are ready. We can... We can baptize you for the remission of your sins this morning. You will be a child of God. We can pray for you this morning. We can help you with the needs that you have spiritually if you'll come while we stand and sing.